Thank you for your nice words. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, um, uh, just relax. I guess this is uh, going to be a subject mostly for medical oncologists, but also for urologists, uh, because I, I was asked really to do something else but prostate cancer. And uh, my other big interest is uh, about germ cell tumors and mostly about the one we don't know exactly how to cure best, uh, what we would call uh, the poor uh, prognosis uh, cancers, and also patients who are relapsing after, after chemotherapy. And this is why I decided to, to give this talk to you there this morning. Uh, actually, maybe Christian could, could replace me and, and, and give a talk, and I, I may sit down with you and, and, and have a, a good breakfast. <laughs> so, um, this is about again metastatic germ cell tumors. Oh, there's a, I guess uh, a, a PowerPoint uh, uh, Apple uh, versus uh, PC problem here. So I, I will I will speak. So really, uh, you know, uh, metastatic germ cell tumors are now classified according to the international classifications for 15 or 20 years now. And they very, they really separate three classes. One class is that of good prognosis, which is really one that we almost, almost cure uh, all the time, and that's defined by the absence of visceral metastasis, basically testis primary or retropenol primary. I don't know whether this really exists, but it's mostly testis primary, and low uh, tumor markers, HEG, AFP, and uh, LDH. Maybe let me try this way. Yeah. Uh, an intermediate prognosis was defined, and we're still probably struggling how to best treat these patients. And it's always the problem with intermediate. You don't really know whether you should just do minimal chemotherapy or more aggressive chemotherapy and surgery. And finally, the poor prognosis uh, group, which is defined by either a metastinal primary cancer, which is really not a good thing to have, uh, whatever the, the tumor markers are, whatever the extent of the disease is, and or extra pulmonary visceral metastasis. So you're counting non-lymph node, non-lung uh, metastasis. And finally, very high tumor markers before chemotherapy is being started, HEG over 50,000, AFP uh, greater than 10,000, or LDH uh, more than 10 times the normal. So it's a, it's a small group of patients, just approximately 15% of uh, all metastatic uh, non-seminomas, and that's only, by the way, for non-seminomas. There's, there's no seminoma here. And classically, the cure rate uh, is or was only 50% uh, when it comes uh, to, to the original publication that is uh, mentioned here, the international classification. Just half of these patients uh, could uh, enjoy a cure. So, for these patients, the standard treatment was established 25 years ago uh, when the uh, Americans could uh, report that four cycles of uh, BEP, so bleomycin, etoposide, and cisplatin, were better than four cycles of the former regimen PVB. This was actually a subgroup analysis of patients with poor risk disease when they were able to report better progression-free survival and better overall survival for patients receiving BEP, and also, by the way, a better tolerance with less neurotoxicity. And this is why uh, four BEPs uh, became the standard this time. So that was 25 years ago. Now, having said that, four is not five, six, seven, or eight cycles. And it's important to remember, because I saw very often people, medical oncologists, not feeling comfortable after three, four cycles and simply continuing uh, because they thought it was better. But actually, we have no proof that additional cycles would give any improvement in terms of outcome. And for sure, this will dramatically increase the risk of paresthesia, auditive toxicity, neutropenic fever, fertility troubles, which are directly linked to the number of cycles. And maybe even more importantly, or you won't see it on the screen, maybe yes, uh, four more beds will give a 2% risk for your patients of meeting this. And why is that? Well, approximately 2% of 
uh, of all the patients who receive more than 2 grams uh, per square meter of etoposide, of cumulative dose, will suffer from secondary uh, acute leukemia. And this is really like this beast, 80% mortality, which is pretty much the same as uh, uh, this uh, horrible snake. So it's really something to, to remember when, when you say, well, I don't know, should I continue, should I stop, etc. I mean, that's a big decision to make. It, it's not just, okay, let's do more one or two more cycles mm -hmm. and we'll see. It can really change uh, the outcome, uh, not necessarily a good way. So, of course, that was 25 years ago, but because testicular cancer is so chemosensitive, everybody believed and probably still believe now that we should do better with higher doses because uh, chemosensitive and chemocurable uh, cancer might be even better cured with higher doses. Actually, we have now three randomized phase three trials looking at high dose chemotherapy plus uh, uh, autograph transplant in this situation. Uh, no randomized French trial using cisplatin as a, as a high dose uh, drug, so that was back in the 80s, something we would probably not do anymore. The, uh, the intergroup US trial and a neo-RTC uh, trial, which used uh, various regimens. So let me briefly uh, summarize to you the data that we have. The French trial is negative, and it's actually not only negative, but the high-dose chemotherapy arm is associated with uh, a lower uh, or worse outcome. It's not significant, but it's there. Now, this trial was really high dose plus autograph on top of already super chemo, not only BEP. I mean, the, 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 the doses of cisplatin in the control arm were, were doubled, and uh, uh, patients had received uh, a quite high dose of etoposide, vimblastin, and bleomycin. So it was not really comparing versus BEP at that time. But really, it's completely negative. The intergroup US trial was really awaited when it came out in the mid 2000. This is the, the reference. Four BEPs <coughs> versus two BEPs plus two high dose chemotherapy. So, so definitely something more modern. And the high dose chemo uh, used drugs that we would uh, probably uh, use in, in, in modern times uh, high dose etoposide, high dose cyclophosphamide, and high dose carboplatin, not cisplatin. 219 patients, a mix of intermediate and poor risk because they had a hard time accruing enough poor risk patients, so they had to accept intermediate risk patients. And maybe that's one also of the reason why they fell, because intermediate patients do pretty much well. And as you can see, there was really uh, no uh, benefit for uh, PFS and absolutely zero benefit for overall survival. And finally, the EORTC trial also tested four BEPs versus uh, sequential high-dose VIP, which was developed by the German group. 137 patients were accrued out of uh, more than 200 planned, and again, they had a difficulty accruing these patients. They are quite rare and difficult to accrue, even on, across the continent. So that uh, we have a data as they are, and as you can see, there was a trend for better progression-free survival, but it didn't reach um, significance. And um, I don't know if, if this is truly a trend for overall survival, but it was statistically negative. So three trials with high-dose chemo and, and uh, autograph transplant, all of them negative. More generally, yeah, yeah, sure. Those last three trials all had follow-ups than five, seven years out. And yet, the differences all seem quite mature within two years. So, right. is that something that you still do in advanced terms? You mean waiting or, yeah. or not waiting? What's basically? the cost of quality uh, for that much longer? Okay, well, at least in my country, that is not very expensive for following up these patients uh, because the system covers quite nicely for that. And people typically want to be follow-up, at least in my country. And there, there are big variations from country to, to, to countries because sometimes they're, well, obviously they're happy to be cured or they're fearing a relapse, so they're happy to, to come back. So typically we have you know, good follow-up data in, in, all our, in all our trials. But you, you're right. Actually, 
most events occur within two to three years, with still a few couple of patients failing in the, in the longer term, like four or five years. Typically, what we try to have is a minimal of three years of follow-up for these patients to, to declare that the trial is mature for analysis, or at least for major analysis. So, more generally speaking, in the last 25 years, we had a series of negative phase three trials. Uh, this is, at least here, various uh, chemotherapy regimen, various hypotheses, various drugs, different mix, etc., etc. All of them are uh, really negative, and usually uh, the conclusion is not superior, more toxic. So uh, forget it. Uh, the only probably thing that we could demonstrate in, in, in this time frame was that um, BP is very similar, let's say, as compared to VIP, so you can use ifosfamide instead of bleomycin if you're fearing the bleomycin toxicity, if the patient has massive pulmonary lesions and if you want to operate on him, you know, these things. But really no more than that. So, yes, no more, uh, no progress was uh, demonstrated, in, at least from randomized trials in the last 25 years. But yes, also, <coughs> We, f we saw a trend for better outcome during this time frame, and again, probably less than 50% of these patients were cured in the 80s and the early 90s, where when it comes to the 2000s, it's probably around 60 or even 60 plus percent of cure rate for these patients. So why is that if it's, it doesn't come from phase three trials? Well, maybe patient education, and some patients do consult earlier with a lower tumor burden, uh, I guess males are, are less shy about consulting whenever they have uh, a problem in their testes. The referral to our trained centers might be a, a major explanation for, for this shift in the, with better outcome, and I will come back to that. Perhaps also the improvement in the management of chemotherapy side effects, and obviously also the improvement in surgery, because surgery is a major uh, thing here to, to contribute to cure with RPLNDs, but also liver surgery, pulmonary surgery, sometimes brain surgery, or even bone surgery. So that might have explained part of, of, the, of the benefit, and there might be other explanations that we don't really know. One example here, for example, and this is really impossible to show in um, phase 3 trial. Let's see, yeah, we don't have, sorry, I, I, I can show you the the pulmonary uh, CT scans or, or X-rays. I had here two pictures of a patient who, who was full of, of brain, of sorry, lung metastasis, and these patients typically this is choriocarcinoma, and typically these patients are at high risk of dying from chemotherapy toxicity, basically within two to three weeks after the start of chemotherapy, and they die of ARDS of acute respiratory. Uh, distress syndrome uh, after 10, 15 uh, days uh, after chemotherapy is being started because there is massive necrosis into their uh, pulmonary um, uh, lesions, bleeding, infection, and they die. And this is actually the experience that we had uh, in the 80s and 90s. As you can see, 90% of these patients developed an ARDS and only a few of them survived and were eventually cured. We decided in 1997 uh, to change all the practice for these patients, and rather than using upfront classical chemotherapy, we would use just three days of cisplatin and topazide, and with no bleomycin, and just stop for a while, have our patients uh, recover, and after 10 or 15 days, we would complete the regimen with the, let's say, two additional days that were missing, and then introducing bleomycin or ifosfamide at this time. And doing that seems to reduce quite dramatically the incidence of ARDS and perhaps also the cure rate in the long term. It's very difficult because it's a small number, but this is really what, what we have. And again, this is typically the kind of thing you just can't show in a phase three trial because it's too rare. Even at all centers, we're discussing 20 patients in 10 years or something, no more than that. And it comes to the question about does experience matter? 
And the answer really seems to be yes when it comes to terrible uh, cancers like, like, like this one, pro-risk uh, GCT. This is a very nice analysis that was uh, performed from, by the ORTC group, by uh, Laurence Collette, who is the, the biostat there. And what she did was uh, an, uh, reanalyzing a phase retrial that was conducted by the ORTC asking a question about chemotherapy. And she simply looked at the number of patients centers were providing to the, to the trial. Less than five patients or other than five patients, five to nine, ten, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see, it makes a huge difference in terms of outcome for the patient. It's a 20% overall difference in overall survival, and progression for survival is even uh, greater. But it's really one out of five patients achieving a cure uh, just because he was referred to, to, the, to the right hospital. There might be bias here. Uh, obviously, you may think that a patient who is more sick is less likely to move to a bigger center. Of course, that, that, that can explain part of the difference. But, but really, if you think about it, you don't really need to be super expert to do well. If you compare centers who had experience with 5 to 9 versus those 10 to 90s or, or over 20, they do pretty much the same. The, you know, the, 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 the centers who do not do well are, are those who see just one patient every X. Okay? So that's really a, a, a big plea here for centralization. I know that here uh, in Vancouver you do a, a great job for, for, for that, and I guess really it's, it's important. I have to say that in many countries that's not the case, including Mike, by the way, and, and his former country as well. So, and this is something we're discussing at the moment in Europe. One thing that we've learned also, I hope you'll see now, sorry, uh, that we've learned in the last 10 years or so is that survival for these patients with poor prognosis disease is clearly linked to tumor marker decline assessed rapidly during the course of chemotherapy. So, uh, again, one thing that, that we've learned in the last uh, 10 years or so for these patients with poor risk disease is that tumor marker declines make a difference, at least in terms of prognosis. And actually, all these folks here were supposed to have poor, poor risk disease. So let's say half of them uh, were supposed to achieve a cure. But as you can see, for patients achieving a rapid tumor marker decline after just one cycle of chemo, you see the subgroup of patients that definitely does much better with a true poor risk group being that of patients with unfavorable tumor decline. So this was demonstrated when uh, tumor markers are being assessed after just one cycle, uh, here to, to the left, and also by the Americans uh, after two cycles of chemotherapy. The problem is that when it's after two cycles of chemo, it might be already too late to, to take, take this into advantage. So uh, those are the maths. For those of you who love the, the, the map, you can, you can do that. But for uh, those of you who are lazy as I am, you can also uh, use the, the software. Just in, 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 include your, uh, write down here, the dates of, uh, of chemotherapy, the values of uh, pre-chemo and post-chemo, HEG and AFP, press the button, and you will know whether your patient has uh, a, tumor, a favorable tumor market decline, yes or no. Christian? Thank you. We emphasize again which time period you look at because that causes a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. um, so, in all our methodology, it's really tumor markers right before chemotherapy, tumor markers at three weeks, basically, 21 days. And, and Where is it's it? It's really something which we need to re emphasize because I've had numerous discussions now, even here in Vancouver, where people look at the over the total four cycles of chemotherapy oh, no. and say, you know, this is unfavorable because in the end it didn't fall. Okay, right. No, no, it, it's really just two assessments before, after, at day 21. And when you, you have your data and you're able to adapt, if you, if you wish, uh, your, your treatment. And this is actually what, what we did and what we've tested prospectively in the uh, JETUC 13 trial, which was an, an international, mostly French trial, uh, that we conducted together with the MDNSN group and, and the Slovakian. 
And we were able to include in this one 263 patients with pro-race disease. It took us 10 years, basically. It was a big effort. All of them received one bat. And uh, as we just said, uh, we assessed the tumor marker declines at day 20 to 21. Patients with a favorable decline simply continued BAPs, and the, the plan was really to prospectively assess that these patients would do well with just BAP and, and surgery, while patients with an favorable decline were randomized to receive either BAP or a dose-dense regimen that we had designed. 200 patients. So this is the, the dose-dense regimen. So again, one classical American BAP uh, initially. And then we uh, intensified the treatment with not only BAP drugs, but also paclitaxel and oxaliplatin, given together with uh, GCSF. This is for two uh, cycles. And then subsequently, patient received cisplatin, ifosfamide, and bleomycin. And the bleomycin is really individualized based on uh, individual lung function assessment. So in some patients, we give less. In some patients, we give more. Also, of course, with GCSF support. So the data were uh, released uh, uh, at ASCO a year ago, uh, and the paper is, is about to, to, to be out soon. And indeed, patients who were randomized to uh, an int intensified uh, regimen did better as compared to patients who continue BEP when they had an unfavorable uh, tumor marker decline, as you can see here. The difference was significant, with a reduction in risk of 34%. In the long term, 63 patients were continuously without progression in the dose-dense arm versus only 46 patients in the uh, BEP arm. So this was for uh, progression for survival. And even for overall survival, we saw a trend. It was not significant, but honestly, the, the trial was not powered to detect overall survival benefit. 73% uh, versus 65%, and again, it's 12 more patients who, who were alive at last follow-up. Also, we could, well, prospectively, basically, reconfirm the pronostic role of tumor marker declines for these patients. If you look at the green curve here, this is for patients with a favorable decline treated with BEP. If you look here to the red curve, this is for unfavorable decline patients also treated uh, with BEP. So exactly the same treatment, but just the, the tumor marker decline, which is different. And it's a big, big difference in terms of outcome for both PFS and overall survival. So there's no doubt that, yes, it's a pronostic uh, factor. And taking it into account can make a difference for, for your patients. And for, for us in France, this is now all a standard uh, management. So this is where we currently stand for patients with poor risk disease. The other uh, difficult situation, obviously, for these patients with a uh, high with a, a poor risk uh, uh, germ cell tumor, is that of a patient who has failed at least one chemotherapy regimen, what we call sal the salvage setting. And uh, in the past, in the 90s, only 25% of these patients would achieve uh, eventually a cure. Actually, things are a little more uh, complex, and we now have uh, pronostic factors that can help us better individualize who is more or less likely to, to achieve cure. And I won't go in, into detail, but you can see that depending on your uh, individual situation, a cure is achieved in, in up to uh, 70 or, or 80 percent, as compared to almost zero percent uh, for a patient who has everything bad, uh, specifically uh, a, a, a mediastinal primary cancer. So what is the evidence for these patients? So first of all, the standard, historically standard, salvage regimen is based on four cycles of a free drug regimen containing cisplatin, ifosfamide, and a third drug that can be either vimblastine, a toposide, Paclitaxel or gemcitabine. And we have data for all these triplets regimen. They have been never compared one, uh, one by one, so we don't really know whether one is better th than the other one. Having said that, vimblastine is probably more toxic and probably, and it's a probably, less active. So more and more we tend not to use vimblastine in this situation, but again, we don't have 
phase-free evidence for that. Etoposide was used as first-line chemotherapy, and, of, and as I, I told you, if you use more than four cycles, your patient has an increased risk of leukemia. So it, again, we tend not to use it very frequently in the triplet. So it's more about patitaxel or gemcitabine for patients with neuropathy after first-line uh, chemotherapy. GCSF is definitely required. That's dangerous chemotherapy regimen here. Some patients can die from chemo, so GCSF is really uh, required for these patients. And obviously, surgery is uh, required for patients with residual masses, but you all know that. Uh, and that's evidence coming from phase two uh, data. What about salvage high-dose chemotherapy per transplant? Again, we have extensive phase two uh, data with single autograft that was reported in the 90s and more, frequent, more recently now with sequential autograph with a TICE uh, regiment at Mem Development Memorial, the high-dose VIP in Germany, others, uh, uh, etc., cetera, et cetera. We actually have two phase two trials testing high-dose chemo plus transplant, and I will uh, come back to that. So, the first one is the IT94 phase three trial that was conducted in Europe in the 90s, and that was for patients with refractory or relapsed GCT after at least uh, one uh, chemotherapy regimen. They received two cycles of chemotherapy with VIP at this time, with Vimblastin. Patients without response were out. You can treat them the way you want it. While patients with a response were randomized, or actually previously randomized, to continue VIP or to receive one cycle of VIP plus one cycle of high-dose chemo with a carbopec regimen, so high-dose cyclophosphamide, carbo, and etoposide. Unfortunately, there was no significant progression-free survival benefit, just a trend here, as you can see, and most importantly, zero benefit in overall survival. And this is really some, something that was uh, not expected. Most of us were really hoping for the trial to be positive. But it is as it is. Now, besides that, we have, as I said, plenty of experience, non-randomized experiences with high-dose chemotherapy. For example, the um, Indiana group has been using carbo plus etoposide without cyclophosphamide at high dose, and they have reported in the New England Journal, by the way, uh, their experience with quite a high number of patients, almost 200. That's good data, but again, it's not comparative data. We don't really know whether this is any better as compared to uh, standard dose chemotherapy. The TICE regimen was developed uh, at Memorial, so it's uh, paclitaxel and ephosphamide, followed sequentially by high-dose carbotoposide, uh, twice three. And this is the original uh, publication that was followed by, by a confirmation showing that for some patients with poor risk salvage situation, many of them can indeed achieve a cure, probably around 50% as compared to historically 20 or something. But again, that's not a comparative trial. Regarding uh, the second uh, phase three trial, that, uh, that is a trial that was uh, conducted in, in Germany, and it was testing not a standard arm, uh, standard uh, chemotherapy arm, but rather two ways of providing, of giving high-dose chemotherapy. Either free high-dose CE or one high-dose triple uh, drug regimen. And actually, the alcohol was stopped off due to uh, toxicity, 4% versus 16% toxic death rate. So again, giving high-dose chemotherapy is not nothing. So we, that's a big decision to make. And even for overall survival, it makes a difference, not necessarily because the, the first regimen is technically better uh, uh, when it comes to, to anti-cancer activity, but simply because it's better to rate it. It's a better way to give high-dose chemotherapy. At least... This is showing us that if you decide to, to use high-dose chemo plus, plus a, a, a transplant, you should probably uh, use uh, this regimen or a similar regimen, not this one. 
So even now, we don't really know whether we should use standard uh, chemotherapy or high-dose chemotherapy. And this is why we want to conduct what we call the TIGER trial. And the TIGER uh, name uh, came uh, several years ago in London after a series of beers. And, uh, uh, and, and really, this is a trial that we would uh, like to, to, to conduct. And it's been very difficult to, to find the money to do it to convince all group to share the efforts, uh, to try to, to, to have the young faculties leading the effort so that the, the old beer would not be like this. Uh, but it's almost about to, to start in, in Europe and hopefully here in North America. And I hope we will we'll, we'll be able to do it. So in conclusion, for these patients with poor risk disease, pr the pronostic role of tumor marker decline is now clearly established. Number two, an all intensification strategy for patients with unfavorable decline after 1BP improves progression for survival. And this is the only uh, new data that we have from phase three trials in 25 years for these patients. And at least for us in France, this is the new standard treatment to, to take advantage of uh, tumor marker decline and base your decision on that. And I'm not saying that you need to use this or that particular regimen for intensification. It's really the philosophy. Regarding high-dose chemotherapy in the salvage setting, it definitely cures some patients. The problem is how to identify them best, and that this is very tricky. We don't really have predictive factor to, to do that. Sequential is better than a single high-dose because we have less toxic death. And we still need to demonstrate that sequential high dose is better than standard dose and that this TIGER trial. And this is it. So we're in October, and I know that Canada is very good for that. But just to remind you that in a couple of weeks from now, uh, we'll have to grow our mustache again because it's going to be November. Thank you very much for your attention.